As I told you on 9-11, I suddenly realized it was my task to make difficult books readable, which is what I've done on the back table. I sometimes describe myself as a man who reads big, thick, old books and writes modern, small books that anyone can understand. And actually, I rather enjoy it. I don't surf the web. People are disappointed when they run into me sometime and some other counter-jihadist, they go, have you seen my website? No. I don't even go to my own website. I have very little interest in the web except for Craigslist and Yahoo Headlines and Drudge. That's it. So, <clears throat> I like reading big, thick, old books. I really do. But I thought when I got my books written, in which the Quran was easy to understand, here's Muhammad, easy to understand, all these books on Sharia and everything were easy to understand, I thought, we win. No, we don't even have gain. Because what I discovered was, other than a minority view, and trust me, you are so minor, everyone else's reaction to the knowledge, to the answer to question, what is the true nature of Islam, react in fear, hatred, and anger. When I try to explain to people something about Islam, they're terrified. So I thought people would run when I got my books published, and indeed they did run away from me. So I thought there was just one great question. What is the true nature of Islam? But I found there was a second question more important. Why are we afraid to know Islam? Now, remember I told you about stories? Here's the thing. My books are factual. They work here. But in dealing with human beings, if you're going to make a sale, any salesman will tell you this, the facts are secondary to the feelings. And where you get feelings is from stories, amongst other places. And I began to think about why is everyone so afraid even though they don't know anything? Well, it turns out they do know little figments of stories about Islam that involve violence. And the knowledge that they were into the slave trade does not come as a shock, really. So, remember I told you that the house of Sufism was like a palace with a smell coming up from the basement? Everyone smelled that smell. They just don't want to talk about it. But it's somewhere deep in the back, almost primordial mind. So, the problem is we don't know the history of Islam. We don't know the answer to this question. This is the world of Islam. How did it happen? You can ask very intelligent people and they will not be able to give you the answer to this question. How did North Africa go from being European and Christian to becoming Arab and Muslim? How did that happen? And is that an important question? How did the Middle East go from being Christian to Muslim? And is that an important question? I think it's an overwhelmingly important question. All right. Now to understand how that Islamic world came about, we're going to have to go about and see how Islam entered our world. Now, to do that, Islam entered the world of the Byzantine Empire. We know that in the Sira, Muhammad's life, his last days were spent killing Christians and subjugating them. After he died, that process continued. So, let's describe the world that Islam invaded. Now we are told that the Roman Empire collapsed when the German barbarians invaded Rome. You all heard that story? Well, that's false. That is not true. It is wrong. What happened was, after the German barbarian tribes invaded Rome, they set up their own version of the Roman Empire. They retained classical culture. They spoke Roman. They hired Roman philosophers and Roman attorneys to teach their children and to run their schools. They came into the Roman Empire not to destroy the empire, but just to get the goods for themselves. The eastern part of the empire, so-called Byzantine Empire, is over here. Now this is after the German invasion. The important point is this. There was still a classical empire. It's not collapsed. Then, after the fall of Rome, the Byzantines gradually exerted their political influence till now this was the new form of the Roman Empire. This is the Byzantine Empire and it is about to be invaded. 
This is the classical world that Islam invaded. Notice that the classical world is still up and running. It's critical to remember that. It had not, it was now weak, but it was still up and running. We're going to see what caused its collapse. Here we see in 25 years, three stages of development of the spread of Islam. This is 25 years work. How is it that the Arabs were able to do to the Byzantine Empire what the Persians could not do in Iran? Here's the answer to that question. It has to do with Iran, actually. The Greeks and the Persians had been having wars since forever. All right? The 300 at Thalipomy, that was about the Persians. All right? Alexander the Great, he defeated the Persians. The Persians kept hammering on the Romans and then the Byzantines, and 25 years before Islam invaded, there was one massive last series of battles that left Persia weak and the Byzantine Empire very weak. Then comes along the Black Plague. One person in three dies. So the Byzantine Empire, when Islam invaded, had been weakened by a long war with Persia and the loss of a third of its population. The economy had collapsed by two-thirds. You think the Obama economy is bad? Try two-thirds. So, we had an empire that was weak, invaded by people with a mission. Now what's important here is, these three different shades of green represent the different caliphs. This empire is beginning to build here came from people who could be described as the apostles of Muhammad. Why is it important to know that? They knew Muhammad. They held his hand. They, one of them, Ali, married his daughter. Abu Bakr was his father-in-law. These people are not just brothers in the religious sense. They're brothers in the family sense. They knew Muhammad like I know my wife. And what did they do? Did they go out preaching the Quran? No, they didn't. They picked up their swords, got on their camels and horses, and went out whacking Christians and Persians. That is, this is the true nature of Islam. Here you see it. This is the fruit on the tree. Massive destruction. Now notice something else that's happened here. Egypt is the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Syria, the heart of the intellectual world of the classical empire. In 25 years, the classical civilization lost its ability to feed itself and lost its biggest brain trust. This destroys classical Christianity. Christianity that we have today is a bloody stump of the original Christianity. Why? This destroyed the heart of it, transformed it. The first stage of the annihilation of classical empire, gone. The heart of it's gone. Okay. A century later, notice over here in Spain, 750 AD, Spain is already Muslim. This is rapid-fire conquest. This is going to become very important because this was not, this happened as it were in the life of a nation overnight. This brutal assault is the key as to why we fear Islam. Now then, you're next going to see history that you've not heard before. I'm not a historian, but I am a scientist. And I can reason from data. I knew, once I read the story of Muhammad, that I had been fed a pack of lies about what caused the Dark Ages. Roman barbarians didn't cause the Dark Ages. First off, why would these barbarians were Germans? These are the same people who made Germany. You tell me they were too stupid to learn how to do Roman law and stuff? Of course not. They were very intelligent people. They didn't cause the collapse. But that's the classical theory. If you go to Vanderbilt, that's what they'll teach you. Here we go with the data. 
There has recently been a lot of classical uh, ancient works that have been translated and put into a database format so they can be accessed. There's been massive archaeological research under the ocean and at the edge of the Mediterranean. From this archaeological research, we're able to track history and economies. All right? That figure I gave you about how the economy collapsed, that came from the study of sunken vessels. Because if you're not buying much, you know, if one in ten, let's say one in ten ships is sunk, I don't, that figure's not that high, but whatever. If you see a lot of sunken ships, there was a lot of ships sailing around. When they go down, the economy goes down. So from this data, we know a lot. And this, in particular, the database of ancient documents, gives us 548 battles that Islam fought against the classical world. This is all new information. I've talked with his, people who are, consider themselves history buffs, and they go, well, let's see, battles of Islam against Europe. Let's see, we've got the invasion, we have tours, we got the invasion of uh, at Gibraltar, we've got uh, Lepanto, Gates of Vienna, collapse of. Okay, that's five. You talk to a historian, and those are the five battles they can scratch up. And it re I remind you, you can have all of these slides if you just send me an email for it. Okay, what does this new data show us? It shows us this. See the white spots? They're brand new battles. They're going to change to red. These are new. Every time, I want to show you this all over again, every tick is 20 years. The new battles for that 20 year period come up in white, then they fade to red to show you the history. So white's what's happening right now, red has happened. Let's see how these 548 battles portray, act out over. We're going to watch in 70 seconds, we're going to watch 1,200 years of conquest. Look how fast this is happening. Bam! Here comes, you didn't know France was hammered that hard, did you? You heard of tours. Watch what's happening in Spain, in the islands. Now many of these raids, or battles, if they're at the coastline, are slave raids. The slaving that took place in here was extensive and went on and on. All of this work is also happening now then. We're now into the golden age of Baghdad. This is the punishment that's being handed out to Christians everywhere. In Spain, after one battle, there were knights' heads were cut off and they made a pile so high that a man on horseback couldn't see over them. All of the European civilization in North Africa is now gone. I have a question. Have you read the 13th tribe? No. Okay. Now pretty soon, and by the way, there will be a period of time, and you can see the clock running up here, there will be a brief blip of five battles that occur in North Africa, the Barbary Pirate Wars. We're on there. Okay. Now then, Byzantium has fallen, now then Eastern Europe is being hammered. Notice that it is relentless. It doesn't stop. This is the history that you're never told about. This is the history that explains how all of this came about. Now then they're getting slower because Islam is becoming weaker. Corruption. All, all, all empires collapse from the inside ultimately. Okay. I say that what caused the collapse of classical civilization was not the invading German barbarian tribes. I say that classical civilization was destroyed by Islam. Now comes the question. Why do we not want to know that? We're going to answer that question. All right, now I want to give you the headlines. With all those little dots, basically what I've showed you is just quantity. Okay? Relentless, but quantity. 
Now I'm going to give, we, we gave you 1,200 years of battles in like 70 seconds. Now we're going to go through in about four minutes. I'm going to give you the headlines from each century so you will know the emotional tone of what is happening. All right, seventh century. Muhammad sent Khalid out, the sword of Allah, to the Jazima tribe to offer Islam. They refused. He annihilated every one of them. At the Battle of Oasis in Iraq, for two days he spent out rounding up the losers, put them in a dry stream bed, and cut off heads until the stream ran with blood. He then took the captain of the Zoroastrian Persian tribe. His wife was there. He cut off the man's head, let the blood drain into the soil, and raped his wife in the bloody soil. That was one of the companions of Muhammad. This is the nature of jihad. Where did Khalid learn how to do that? From Muhammad. From Muhammad at the Battle of Kaibar. Umar conquered Jerusalem and every Jew and every Christian became a demi, which is a third class semi-slave. You're now going to see, for the next few centuries, you're going to see Golden Age. We're told this myth of the Golden Age, how wonderful Islam is. So here's what's happening during the Golden Age. They started attacking Sindh, which is the Hindus. 26,000 Hindus died. Armenian nobles were herded into a church after a debate, and the building burned down on top of them. At Ephesus, 7,000 Greeks are enslaved. We're still having the Golden Age. All new churches were ordered destroyed. At Amorium, there was massive enslavement of all the Christians. The Egyptian Christians revolt over the Jizya, which is the demi tax under the Sharia. Churches are burned, vineyards destroyed. 10th century, we're still in the Golden Age. In Thessalonica, 22,000 Christians enslaved. Christians massacred in Seville. In Egypt and Syria, 30,000 churches destroyed. You have your religion, I have mine. Still in the Golden Age, 6,000 Jews in Morocco killed. Hundreds of Jews in Cordoba killed. 4,000 Jews in Granada killed. Georgia and Armenia invaded. In Hindustan, 15,000 killed, a half million enslaved. Golden Age, still upon us. In Yemen, the Jews are given the choice of convert or die. The Christians of Granada are deported to Morocco. And in India, cities are destroyed under the order convert or die. In one town, 20,000 Hindus became slaves. Still the Golden Age. 50,000 Hindu slaves decided to get freedom by converting to Islam. A new 20-year campaign created 400,000 new Muslims out of Hindus. Buddhist monks, Buddhist monks butchered, nuns raped. In Damascus and Safed, mass murder of Christians. Jews in Marrakesh massacred. Tabriz forced conversion of Jews. Still, we're in the Golden Age. There are riots in Cairo. Churches are burned. Jews of Tabriz are forced to convert. Tamerlane, one of the most evil men who ever learned, ever lived, massacred 90,000 Hindus in one day. 30,000 in another battle, massacred in cold blood. Another Muslim leader takes 180,000 Hindu slaves. Oops, we're out of the Golden Age. See if you notice any change in tenor. Tamerlane destroys 700 villages in India. Now then comes a, a... He then turned to Iraq and annihilated the Nestorian and Jacobite Christians. The Nestorian Christians Half of the Silk Route in China was Nestorian Christian. The Nestorian Christians had emissaries and uh, missionaries in the court of China. Afghanistan was partly Christian. All right. Gone. This is part of the destruction of the church that no one knows about. 700 years of attack, they finally destroy Constantinople. 16th century. Uh, the son of Tamerlane destroys temples, forced conversions. Two of his generals built two towers of human heads. Once again, you couldn't see over them. And then noble women, Hindu women, started the practice of sati, which was mass suicide, in order not to be sex slaves inside of the sultan's harem. 17th century, Jews of Yemen and Persia forced to convert, forced conversions of Greeks. The Zoroastrians are persecuted in, in uh, Persia. And over a half million killed Hindus. 18th century, more Zoroastrian persecution, Jews of Jeddah expelled, Jews of Morocco massacred, Hindu persecution continues. 19th century, more forced conversion of Jews, Jews of Baghdad massacred, oops, quarter million Armenian Christians slaughtered in Turkey. Now then in Persia, the Zoroastrians are completely annihilated. 
20th century, over one million Armenian Christians killed. One million. So you now, you now not only know the number of battles, you now see the tenor of what's going on. You now know quality and quantity. Do you get the drift on how bad this was? Now then, the establishment doctrine is, is that we've already told you classical collapse had nothing to do with Islam, and indeed Islam was a source of good because the hillbilly Europeans lost their classical learning and the shrewd, smart Arab Muslims preserved all the knowledge in the Golden Age. This is what is taught in our schools. I maintain that it was annihilated by Islam. Okay, we now need, we've been talking about land here. I now want to talk about water because classical civilization was based upon the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt was part of the Mediterranean world. It was not part of the African world, okay? Because to go from Alexandria, Egypt to Nigeria was a lifetime. But you could get on a ship and be there in 10 days. Does this make sense? It was cheap transportation. You could haul a ton of grain from Egypt to Rome as much as it cost 75 miles by ox cart. This is important. I'm going to be driving back on the interstate after I finish talking here. I do not expect to be attacked or shot at on the way. I presume that the interstate is safe travel. It used to be that way under the Roman peace. That ended. The importance of naval work, as many as 500 boats could be in the harbor of Constantinople. The collapse of the freedom of sea. Let me show you something. Now we know this from history, the data. Rome used to communicate with France by boat. After Islam, they went overland through the Alps. Why did they do that? There was no longer freedom of the sea. Here's interesting. The Black Plague was a known problem in the Mediterranean. It used to take four months to get from here to Constantinople because there was sea trade back and forth. Well, that was eliminated. So now then, when there was an outbreak of the Black, outbreak of the Black Plague, it went from harbor to harbor, harbor, all around here, and it took four years to get to here. Do you see the point I'm making? There was that little freedom of trade. As a merchant striking out to do business, you could wind up with your ship gone, your goods gone, and you're in chains enslaved. By the way, this cuts down a lot on commerce. A brag. The Christians couldn't float a plank on the inland sea. What did this do? It isolated Europe and impoverished Europe. So, you, you know the uh, business of the Barbary pirates? You know the business of the Somali pirates? Same, same. Same, same. It is Sunnah. It is Sunnah. The way of Muhammad. There's a famous hadith which is repeated endlessly in which Muhammad awakes in a dream and he sees his jihadists sailing the inland sea. Islam always practices, where possible, economic warfare. Muhammad attacked caravans. What was attacked in New York? Ooh, Trade Center. This, economic warfare. I am an admirer of Islamic civilizational war methods. They're superior to everyone else's thinking in war. They use everything for war. Everything, including the womb. This was an economic jihad. There were three, you've heard of the Dark Ages? Well, there were three Dark Ages. One in Europe, one in Turkey, one in North Africa. You weren't told that, were you? I wonder why. Here we see some ruins. What's the importance of these ruins? Well, they're up and standing. What happened to all the ruins in Rome? Well, the people who were still living there used them as quarries. They harvested them. The Colosseum remained simply because it was so big. 
What does this tell us here? If all this stone is still stacked up, there were no people. The invasion of North Africa was so brutal and so fast that it actually left in the harbor a layer of silt. Here's how that happened. North Africa used to be farmland, irrigated farmland. The Romans, clever men that they were, put along the roads in North Africa olive trees for shade and for keeping the road fixed for free. Because what would happen is, is you would bid on buying a lease on a stretch of Roman road in North Africa, you maintain the olive trees and the road, and you got to keep the olives. So the Romans got money from selling the lease, and then they got the road fixed for free, and somebody has a business making money. Is this clever or what? That all ended. Because the invading Arabs were not farmers, they were herdsmen. The people there were Christian, and so therefore, when the goat, every, the average Arab family would own 50 goats. They put their goats out into the fields of Christians, and the Christians as dimmies had no right to protest. Between death and the erosion of the crops, there was, ero uh, the, this produced a layer of silt in the harbors. So that's how brutal, hard, and fast came about this collapse of economy in North Africa. What was left for a European economy? Furs, lumber, swords, and slaves. We're now really getting to one of the points where we don't want to know this history. Anybody here all real proud about how some of your ancestors were taken off a coast in Italy and then put into a harem in North Africa? And now you have children from that who are distant relations? You see, you may have distant relations in the Arab world you don't know about because a million Christians were sold into slavery. And by the way, the Venetians helped to do that. And another embarrassing piece of news is this. The Jews were very big in the trans-Mediterranean slave trade. Nobody comes out of this looking good. No one looks good. Are you also beginning to see like, I don't think I want to know any more about this history at all. Okay? Are you, are you catching on here? All right. Now the other thing we're told that's so bad about Christianity and so pitiful about those poor Muslims are the Crusades. Who's ever heard this? Well, the Crusades, oh, that's so embarrassing. Gosh, you know, we got out of Europe. We went over there and invaded the Arab lands, and then we killed them and hurt them. And like, oh, I've heard preachers wallow in pity about how drastically bad the Crusades were. All right, first off, Islam, remember, destroyed 30,000 churches. The Jews and Christians were demis. There was infinite number of brutality against Christians. Christians were fleeing the Middle East, and the Byzantine, Empire, Byzantine Emperor appealed to the Pope, help us, please. Now, this was a big thing to do, because the Byzantine Emperor and the Pope did not get along at all. But these were desperate people. And what did the Pope look out and see? This is the world that he saw in 1100, the time of the First Crusade. Well, let's see. This much of Spain is um, Muslim, and we're getting our behind kicked on a regular basis. Oh, well, this Christianity's gone. Oops, this Christianity's gone. And look at all the battles in the, non in, in the areas of, that are still Christian. Do you see the geopolitical problem that the Pope was facing here? This was not just some, you know, we'll saddle up, get on our horses, and go steal from them Arabs, which is what you're told. This is the political picture. But now then, let's do this. Let's look at a battle map for the Crusades. Let's be fair. I showed you the Jihad map. Now here comes the Crusade battle map. We're almost done. That's it. Now we're told that the Crusades are the moral equivalent of Jihad. And therefore we need to be ashamed and whine and cry. All right. The Crusades were defensive, lasted 300 years, and the last one was over 800 years ago. All the Jihad was offensive, lasted 1400 years, and it's happening right now. In all probability, some Christian is being slaughtered in Nigeria today. Now, 
Is this moral equivalence? Why, why, why won't they teach this in a church school? So the ministers will stop, oh, the crusades were just so terrible. No, the crusades were one of the few times the church put steel in its spine. And then we apologize for it. Now then, let's go to the great benefits of Islam. We're told about two different golden ages. We're told about Andalus, the wonderful empire in Spain in which there was multicultural peace, and Jew and Christian and Muslim all lived together in a golden age in Europe. You ever heard that? Well, here we go. This is the battle map of the golden age in Andalus. Now, while all this is going on, orders for slaves are being filled. The first slave order out of Spain was the caliph ordered up three thousand blonde virgins. They were shipped out of Spain. Battles are going on in which Christian knights die, but notice something here. The Christians won't quit fighting. This is going to take 700 years and there's going to be nearly 200, it's 150 battles fought. Where was this caliph uh, located? Uh, there was more than one caliph at the time. This was a caliph in North Africa. Okay. okay. Now then, looking at this, do you understand why when Isabel and Ferdinand were finally in full power, they told every Muslim in Spain to get out of here? They drove everyone out. Okay. My question for you is this. Was Andalus a multicultural golden age or a reign of terror? I claim it was a reign of terror, and it was not a golden age at all. And yes, there were a few people who had it good. The elites had it good. There were some rich Jews and rich Christians that had it good. Also, otherwise, there was constant war, slavery, and Christians had to wear robes so you could tell a Christian from a block away. And a Christian couldn't carry a sword, and they paid special taxes. And then we come to the question, why are we told this story? Now we have the Baghdad Golden Age. Here we go. This is all the battles that are fought during the period of the Golden Age in Baghdad. Now not only are they as busy as they can be killing Christians, but they're also busy establishing the Sharia doctrine, they're also busy establishing the Hadith doctrine, and they're also busy in doing things like slave trading. You know all those exotic photo pictures you've seen of the harem? They're sort of pre-playboy sexy, when beautiful women in gauzy outfits, all of those women were Christians. Less romantic sounding, isn't it? The other thing that's happening in Baghdad is this. A new philosophy is being generated in which there is no cause and no effect. This turns out to paralyze the mind. Okay, those were all the battles that were fought during the mythical Golden Age. Okay, during the Golden Age, Christians and Jews were demis, Christians were sex slaves. Here's one that gets me. During this Baghdad Golden Age, they evolved a philosophy in which there were no laws of nature and there was no cause and effect. I'm a scientist. We work off of two laws, the law of contradiction, does the data contradict the data, and the law of cause and effect. I've just explained to you why out of their Golden Age, why you don't find Muslims getting Nobel Prizes in science. You cannot be a scientist and not believe in cause and effect. You just can't. Won't work. Now then, the Christians did all of the vaunted translation of the Golden Age text, and get this. We're told that this was such a great peak of learning, they destroyed 90% of the books. And we're told that the remaining 10% they preserved is like, oh, this was the Golden Age. Oh, we live in eternal gratitude to the uh, Muslims. If they had to come along, we'd have had 100% of them. Presented with a library in India, the largest library in the world was a Buddhist library in Nalanda. 
They came to him and reported the existence after they had conquered, and they said, what shall we do with the library? The order from the general was this. If it contains any information that is in the Quran, we already have it, burn it. And if it contains any information that is not in the Quran, it is false, burn it. The same was done with most all of the libraries. And why are we told this was some wonderful golden age that preserved knowledge for us? Ottoman Empire, 1683. The reason I have this up here, Islam in Europe. That's the world today. I've now explained to you how this world came about. It came about through relentless, brutal persecution of everyone who was not a Muslim. Now then, let's change to modern times. All of that work stops in 19 and 22. This works off a database of 19,000 jihad attacks since 9-11. There are things like this. I know the date, the country, the city, how many are killed, how many are injured, and a description. Now, when you present a guy like me with 19,000 pieces of data, I start asking questions, how do we make this make sense? So let's make it make sense. By the way, you did hear all about these 19,000 attacks in the Tennessee and in the local newspaper, didn't you? You, you, you did hear about this. It was on the nightly news. Oh, <laughs> the, workplace the workplace incident. Oh, yeah, I got that. All right. Anyway, moving along here. This, by the way, is where all these took place. I just think that's interesting. And you'll notice something. This is the Islamic world, and it all centers around it. But notice how much is happening in Europe. Okay. I take the data, and I parse it, and I divide it. I use Islamic doctrine to analyze this data. What does Islam insist on? Well, in my first lecture, I told you they're fixated on the kafir, right? So I use the kafir to analyze this data from an Islamic standpoint. See, I'm the ultimate multiculturalist. No, really. I'm the only person you've ever met who analyzes Islam on the basis of Islam. Here we go. Here we have, in the last 10 years, the total number of attacks. In the green, we have Muslim on Muslim violence. You mean a Muslim will kill a Muslim? Really? They're doing it in Syria as we speak, right? Remember Iran, Iraq? Okay, then we have the only one I care about. I mean, my motto here is sell weapons and intelligence to the loser. I'm very serious. You think I'm joking. Okay, here's, a, here's our story right here. Stays pretty level. That's interesting. By the way, there's hardly a day in which there's not a jihad attack. Modern jihad is relentless, just like classical. Oh, by the way, one of the things this curve proves right here, Islam is bad for Kafirs, Islam is bad for Muslims. Islam is bad for Muslim and non-Muslim. That's what this data shows us. You want to argue with that? Okay, modern jihad is relentless, but what did we see in the other battle map? It was relentless. There are two types of jihad against the Kafir and against Muslim. You see, every time they kill a Muslim, the reason in Syria they're killing other Muslims, they're not real Muslims. Okay? Now then, we've introduced, however, a new phenomena. The mom and pop non-state jihadi shop. Okay? All of those battles up to 1922 were out of the caliph. Okay? We now have non-state jihad. That is all that is different. Okay, jihad attacks per year. I just chose the top four nations. But this doesn't really give us what we want because Israel's teeny weeny and India's great big. So let's do this on per capita. Now then, Israel, I bet you were surprised about Thailand. You didn't know that Thailand was getting whacked on a regular basis, did you? And look, here's a Christian nation, the Philippines, ranks number three. And in India was Hindu. Whoops, wait a minute. Do you know what I just told you? Jihad is against the Jew, the Buddhist, the Christian, and the Hindu. This is the data. Now you go to these dialogues, these multicultural smoozes they have, where the preacher and the rabbi and the imam show up. The preacher and the rabbi show up to tie. The Muslim shows up to win. And then what does the Muslim tell them? Oh, the Christians and the Jews, they're people of the book. Oh, we have a, we're brothers in the religion of Abraham with the Christian and the Jew. You know, we're practically the same. We're brothers in Abraham. How's that stuff work out? Well, here's one of your people of the book. 
Here's another people of the book. Turns out they'll kill a Jew, a Buddhist, a Christian, or a Hindu just as fast as they will another. So much for being brothers in the religion of Abraham. The data does not support the theory. Therefore, the theory is wrong. There is no brotherhood of Abraham except in the minds of people who occupy pulpits. The jihad is against the Jew, the Buddhist, the Christian, the Hindu, and the secularist, by the way. The secularists are the worst of all. Well, maybe worse than the Hindu. It gets hard to know, you know, I mean, really. It's against all kafirs. That's who the jihad is against. The religion of peace. Here we go. 548 battles, 19,000 jihad attacks. In 12 decades, in 1,400 years that are jihad free, therefore, Islam is 91% violence and 9% peace. So George Bush was 9% right when he declared religion of peace. Constant violence is why? There's a doctrine. The doctrine of jihad is found in the Sirah, the Quran, and the Hadith. We've already been over this. They don't like Kafirs. We have a whole doctrine of jihad within the text. Islam was only successful through jihad. Therefore, we have a doctrine which produces jihad and it produces this effect of the collapse of civilizations. Here you go. Tears of jihad. 270 million dead over 1400 years. Read them and weep. Read them and weep. The doctrine drives history. History shows the true nature of political Islam. Political Islam is the enemy of all Kafir nations. There's an intellectual history. In 1400 years, I've read a lot of old documents. They never talk about the Muslim. They talk about the Arab, the Turk, the Moor, Al Qaeda, Asian. And it's always been by specialist. And today, all the established specialists are apologists for Islam. Why was the Quran code not cracked in recently? How come we don't teach Muhammad? And why is the Golden Age propaganda taught? Why do we remain ignorant and keep suffering? I maintain there's a reason for this. I maintain that this constant brutality over the centuries has produced in the Western mind the equivalent of the abused dog, the beaten wife, and the raped child. We do not think correctly. Everybody's seen the beaten dog that when you approach it, that is the Western mind. We deny the attacks, how much jihad is ever reported. The churches will not even admit that a Christian suffers anywhere. Fear, Muhammad used fear. Any public critic of Islam has a certain fear element there. Guilt, oh, we haven't treated Islam right. If we treated him better, everything would be good. We don't teach the history. We humiliated. Who here is going to go home and brag about how your ancestors were slaves, how your history was annihilated, and that all we teach is the lie of the Golden Age? Have you not noticed since 9-11 how bitter and angry politics has gotten? The reason is we're not allowed to get angry at the enemy, so we get cranky with each other. We're powerless. Anybody want to debate about this? The abuser. Muslims will not admit they sold a single slave or ever killed a person. They're arrogant and self-confident. Islam is perfect. Word Islam means submit. They expect submission out of us and they get it. Islam is the victim. After 9-11 I heard this. The real victims of 9-11 were the Muslims. You heard that anywhere? After 1400 years of jihad, brutality, enslavement, theft, deception, rape, annihilation, and insults, the Kafir mind has become identical to that of an abused victim. Our only solution is to face our history and welcome it and embrace it. This is exactly the way we will heal our nation is the way we heal a person who has been brutalized. You have to go back to the original event. And this is why we are afraid. Thank you. Mm -hmm.